Hello, 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 and welcome to the Beyond Shakespeare podcast live, and I am your host, Robert Crichton. And uh, just as we make sure that the live stream is indeed live and that you are out there, I will do some introductory remarks that are not desperately vital as I turn around and just check now that the laptop and the connection and the internet are all in sync. If you can't hear me, if you can't hear me, then this is being recorded separately and you will be able to listen to this again later. If there's any buffering issues, it will all be backed up and you will get a chance to catch up anon. Let's see if anyone's left me any messages saying that they're not getting anything. No, the stream is good. This week I am reading Beware the Cat by William Baldwin, which is a fantastic novel. Uh, I think we're going to risk calling it the first English novel. Some people will disagree with that statement, but let's put it this way. It's a book with a narrative that's all threaded together in various exciting ways, and it's really good, so I don't really care whether it's a novel or not. Um, I think there are various trigger warnings and things to mention. Uh, first of all, it is... A bit anti-Catholic, it is, shall we say, not an ecumenical matter. Uh, so um, do be warned of that. It is, shall we say, uh, not subtle at times uh, in that debate. So uh, for those who haven't twigged, beware the cat is, of course, beware the Catholic. And there's various uh, interplays and connections that turn up as we go along. Today I'm going to be reading from the opening of the book. I'm not going to actually get very far into it today. Uh, I want to start primarily with setting up the world of the court um, and the context of which this was written, or at least was originated. So it starts life somewhere in 1552-53, uh, and the author is associated with a number of people who are all working on reveling and activity in the court of Edward VI, who is at this time having the temerity to be very unwell and possibly dying. He possibly doesn't know that yet, uh, but in a few months' time he will definitely peg out, uh, which means that a court which at the beginning of the the, uh, the narrative of how this, this book was written is firmly and quite fervently Protestant, will soon become Catholic, which means that the beginnings of the writing of this book and, and its creation are curtailed, and it doesn't get published for another 10 years uh, when writing anti-Catholic texts uh, becomes slightly easier to do. Queen Mary, of course, not being Catholic herself and, and quite fervently so herself. The difference between Edward and Mary uh, being quite extreme. So the narrative that the book presents is connected with the court and connected potentially with actual events, um, though, of course, how much dramatic license uh, comes into that is is for you to, to run with or, or reject. So the, the book starts uh, with various uh, people working on interludes and entertainments for Edward VI towards the end of 1552 uh, into early 1553. These events will be delayed uh, by Edward's ill health and will eventually come out and be performed. Um, and there's an awful lot of accounts we have of those entertainments of which uh, Baldwin and the characters who he he opens the book with, uh, Ferrers, etc., are all working on interludes and masks and entertainments for Edward VI. Now, I've been working on quite a few bits of material from uh, 1553 uh, for a live show that has had to be postponed. And also I've done quite a lot of work on some early uh, interludes, uh, early interludes by John Hayward. We've done all of the John Hayward plays that survive. Now the plays that survive for John Hayward uh, are written about 20 years earlier than this period that we're looking at. 
But John Hayward himself is also uh, about. He's not mentioned in the text. But he's part of a theatrical scene that's going on to entertain the king. And there are some interesting crossovers that I'm going to bring up as we go. The novel is feeds not only into storytelling traditions of stories wrapped up in stories wrapped up in stories. So someone starts telling a story about something that a conversation that was had late at night. There's a bit of a sleepover by these interluders. And and they start telling, uh, uh, discussing issues that the, the, the interlude that they're working on um, has brought up. And that leads to a story which leads to characters telling additional stories. And they're all interlaid in that way, which is a very, very ancient tradition. But it also looks ahead. Because if we think of this as, as a horror story or a ghost story, ghostly sort of tradition, um, then you can look forward to Frank, the creation of Frankenstein with the idea that a collection of people are sat around telling each other scary stories. And the fact that this narrative is, is presented to us as something that one was told, the author was told this story, also connects with later uh, narrative traditions. So it's, it's rather like uh, the kind of things that happen in, uh, say, an M.R. James uh, ghost story. So there's lots of connections going back in time, going future in time, um, that you'll find familiar, uh, as well as uh, as some things that will be unfamiliar. So uh, let's let's briefly talk about the court. So these these characters, these real life characters, are all working producing entertainments, and there's there's a whole selection of plays and masks and dances and tumblings and. Uh, for which we've got lots of accounts of the costuming and the kinds of things that's going on. Now, uh, our, our author here, William Baldwin, at this time in 1552-53, he's, he's writing at least uh, one play, or in charge of one play, uh, which is a play of Ireland, and there is a character in Beware the Cat who's going to refer to uh, uh, stories from Ireland, so I wonder if there's a, a little interesting connection there. Also around the same time, by one of those coincidences that makes life interesting, is a mask known as a mask of cats. Uh, now one wonders whether this propensity for lots of cats is, is everyone's playing the same word play with the name, the word cat and Catholic uh, for the entertainment of Edward VI. It's also possible that Edward VI really liked cats, which would be unfortunate if he went to see the mask of cats because the production of the costumes required the massacre of 360 cats to, to produce. And also considering that Edward uh, was suffering from uh, some kind of uh, lung complaint and, uh, and surrounded by allergens might not have necessarily been particularly good for him. I'm not seriously suggesting that, uh, that Edward was killed by cats, uh, but I, 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 I like to play with that as, a, as an, a silly idea. So one of the leaping off points for the book, which we will be getting to in a moment, are the ideas and the question uh, that leaps up about uh, intelligence, reason and man versus beast. And biblically, the idea is always that Man has dominion over beasts. Beasts do not have reason, do not have that kind of intelligence. And this is an idea that turns up in a lot of debates, uh, of which, uh, again, talking about John Hayward, he explicitly goes on about the question of whether it is better to have reason and intelligence, whether it is better to live as an animal, um, uh, without reason, or whether it is better to to have knowledge and understanding. So if you'd like to go into that a bit more, once uh, you've listened to Beware the Cat, uh, then there's elements of that in his uh, John Hayward's play Witty and Witless, which we've recorded for the podcast. Uh, there's a tiny bit of that also in Gentleness and Nobility. These are all plays uh, about 20 years earlier that I say John Hayward is about. But there's also a random fragment of John Hayward's which just sort of leapt out at me today, and I'm going to just preface this reading with this. We don't know when John Hayward wrote this, but he's still in court. 
he's still writing. He is producing entertainments at the same time as Ferrer's et al. Um, and he wrote this short speech for a character called Reason. And uh, I, I hope it may connect with uh, the text you're about to hear. So this is a character, a personification of reason, uh, talking to mankind, and it talks about reason and man in relation to, in part, animals. And the difference between man the commander and beasts being by man commanded is only reason in man, the discerner of good and ill, the good in man elected by me, and the ill in man by me rejected. Man obeying me shineth in excellency, and disobeying me showeth man's insolency. Now since I reason am the only quality that qualifieth man in such a temperance as setteth man in place of principality above all beasts to stand in governance, who but I, over man, should himself advance to govern likewise, since I bring man thereto, and keep man therein doing, as I bid him do. So the question of, of intelligence and man uh, as opposed to animals is alive and has currency in the court at the time, and it is this that the book leaps forward from into tales of talking cats and magic and horror. So we begin the text. I hope I haven't forgotten anything there. I should point out that I'm trying to be as accurate as I can, but I am fundamentally just a storyteller, and if I have overstated any of the points here, do correct me. I can put in some corrections tomorrow. So the book opens with a short s series of lines of verse which seem to have been written later. The, pu the book wasn't published uh, until the 1560s, good 10 years pass. Um, the climate is, is uh, open for, again, ca abuse of Catholics uh, by, by the Protestant uh, hierarchy. So this opening oration uh, seems to have been written a little later. There's at least one interesting uh, rhyme, uh, one point which I haven't quite decided what to do with. So to the reader. This little book, beware the cat, most pleasantly compiled in time obscured, was so and so since that hath been exiled. Exiled because, perchance at first, it showed the toys and drifts of such as then by wiles and wills maintained popish shifts. Shifts such as those in such a time delighted for to use, whereby full many simple souls they did full sore abuse. Abuse? Yea, sure, and that with spite, when as the cat gan tell of many pranks and popish priests, both foolish, mad, and fell. Fell, sure, and vain, if judgment right appear to be in place. And so, as fell in pleasant wise, this fiction shows their grace. Grace. Nay, sure, ungraciousness of such and many mo which may be told in these our days to make us laugh, or so. Also to laugh, nay, rather weep, to see such shifts now used, and that in every sort of men true virtue is abused. Abused! Yea, and quite downcast. Let us be sure of that. And therefore now, as hath been said, I say, beware the cat. The cat full pleasantly will show some slights that now are wrought, and make some laugh which unto mirth to be constrained a lot. Loathe, yea, for our passing grief that much bereaves their mind, 
for such disorder as in states of every sort they find. Find? Yea. Who can now boast but that the cat will him disclose? Therefore, in midst of mirth, I say, Beware the cat to those. So that opens the opening little verset there. Um, again, very pointedly, making the connection between uh, Catholicism and the cat of the title. And it is uh, an element that the cats do turn up throughout this text as overhearers, as listeners in. It's feeding a sense of, of paranoia about uh, Catholics within the land. So again, it's, it's, it's not necessarily the, uh, the nicest of starting points. The opening dedications continue uh, with uh, a, a dedication to Esquire John Young. And uh, this is uh, rather fun. There's a couple of nice little bits in this. To the right worshipful Esquire John Young, grace and health. I have penned for your mastership's pleasure one of the stories which Master Streamer told the last Christmas, and which you so fain would have heard reported by Master Ferrers himself. And although I be unable to pen or speak the same so pleasantly as he could, yet have I so nearly used both the order and words of him that spake them, uh, which is not the least virtue of a reporter, that I doubt not, but that he and Master Willet shall in the reading think they hear Master Streamer speak, and he himself in the like action shall doubt whether he speaketh or readeth. I have divided his oration into three parts, and set the argument before them, and an instruction after them, with such notes as might be gathered thereof. So, making it book-like, and intituled, Beware the Cat. But, because I doubt whether Mr. S Master Streamer will be contented that other men plough with his oxen, I mean pen such things as he speaketh, which perhaps he would rather do himself, to have as he deserveth the glory of both. Therefore, I beseech you to learn his mind herein. And if he agree to pass it in such sort, yet that he peruse it before printing, and amend it, if any point I have mistaken him. I pray you likewise to ask Master Ferrers his judgment herein, and show him that the cure of the great plague of uh, Master Streamer's translation out of the Arabic, which he sent me from uh, Margate's, shall be imprinted as soon as I may conveniently. And if I shall perceive by your trial that Master must a streamer allow my endeavours in this kind, I will hereafter, as Plato did by Socrates, pen out such things in of the rest of our Christmas communications as shall be to his great glory, and no less pleasure to all them that desire such kinds of knowledge. In the meanwhile, I beseech you to accept my good will, and learn to beware the cat so shall you not only perform that I seek, but also please the Almighty, who always preserve you. Amen. Yours to his power, G.B. And G.B. being William Baldwin, uh, the initials that he used for himself. Lots of lovely things in there, uh, building on the idea that this is all true, it's coming from reported speech. You can go to the the the, uh, the the actual speakers themselves to find out whether there are any errors. Uh, uh, interesting question of sort of uh, questions of consent about whether he uh, has the permission to send this out for printing. So it's almost a dedicatory letter of uh, of agreement prior to printing. Um, also a sort of disclaimer that, you know, all errors are, are my own unless corrected otherwise. Um, also little hints at the possibility of a sequel if things go well. Uh, there, there were other stories told that Christmas and, uh, and that there is always room for more. That's it for my interjections now. I will move forward with the, uh, the rest of today's reading. Uh, without interruption. Uh, it is essentially a nighttime 
sleepover setting. These chaps who are busy trying to prepare interludes for the king are tired, sleeping in the same room, and stories get told. The argument. It chanced that at Christmas last, I was at court with Master Ferrers, then Master of the King's Majesty's Pastimes, about setting forth of certain interludes, which, for the King's recreation, we had devised and were in learning. In which time, among many other exercises among ourselves, we used nightly at our lodging to talk of sundry things for the furtherance of such offices, wherein each man as then served, for which purpose it pleased Master Ferrers to make me his bedfellow, and upon a pallet cast upon the rushes in his own chamber to lodge Master Willet and Master Streamer, the one his astronomer, the other his divine. And among many other things too long to rehearse, it happened on a night, which I think was the 28th of December, after that Master Ferris was come from the court and in bed, there fell a controversy between Master Streamer, who with Master Willet had already slept their first sleep, and me, that was newly come unto bed. The effect whereof was whether birds and beasts had reason. The occasion thereof was this. I had heard that the king's players were learning a play of Aesop's crow, wherein the most part of the actors were birds, the device whereof I discommended, saying it was not comical to make either speechless things to speech, uh, speechless things to speak, or brutish things to common reasonably. And although in a tale it be sufferable to imagine and tell of something by them spoken or reasonably done, which kind Aesop laudably used. Yet it was uncomely, said I, and without example of any author, to bring them in lively parsonages to speak, do, reason, and allege authorities out of authors. Master Streamer, my lord's divine, being more divine in this point than I was aware of, held the contrary part, affirming that beasts and fowls have reason, and that as much as men, yea, and in some points, more. Master Ferrers himself and his astronomer waked with our talk and hearkened to us, but would take part on neither side. And when Master Streamer had, for proof of his assertion, declared many things of Elephants that walked upon cords, hedgehogs that knew always whether, what weather would come, foxes and dogs that, after they had been all night abroad killing geese and sheep, would come home in the morning and put their necks into their collars, parrots that bewailed their keepers' deaths, swallows that with celandine opened their young ones' eyes, and an hundred things more which I denied to come of reason and to be but natural, kindly action alleging for my proof, authority of most grave and learned philosophers. Well, quoth Master Streamer, I know what I know, and I speak not only what by hearsay of some philosophers I know, but what I myself have proved. Why, quoth I then, have you proof of beasts and fowls reason? Mm, yea, quoth he. I have heard them, and understand them, both speak and reason, as well as I hear and you understand. At this Master Ferrers laughed, uh, but I, remembering what I had read in Albertus' works, thought there might be somewhat more than I did know, uh, wherefore I asked him what beasts or fowls he had heard, and where and when. At this he paused a while, and at last said, If that I thought you could be content to hear me, and without any interruption till I have done ma and mark what I say, I would tell you such a story of one piece of mine own experimenting as should both make you wonder and put you out of doubt concerning this matter. 
This I promise you, for if I do tell it, that as soon as any man curiously interrupteth me, I will leave off and not speak one word more. When we had promised quietly to hear, he, turning him so, turning himself so in his bed as we might best hear him, said as followeth. The first part of Master Streamer's oration. Being lodged, as I thank him, I have been often, at a friend's house of mine, which more Romish than within than garish without, standing at St Martin's Lane End, and hangeth partly upon the town wall that is called Aldersgate, either of one Aldrich or else of elders, that is to say the ancient men of the city, which among them builded it, as bishops did bishop's gate, or, or else of elden trees, which perchance, as they do in the gardens, now thereabout. So, while the common there was vacant, grew abundantly in the same place where the gate was after builded, and thereof elden gate, as Moorgate took the name of the field without it, which had been a very moor. Or else... Because it is the most ancient gate of the city, was thereof in respect of the other, as Newgate called the Elder Gate, or else as Ludgate taketh the name of Lud, who buildeth it. So most part of heralds I know will soonest descend that Alderus uh, <laughs> uh, buildeth this. But they are deceived, for he and his wife Allgay built it Allgate, which thereof taketh the name, as Cripplegate doth of a cripple, who begged so much of his life, as put to the silver weathercock, which he stole from Paul Steeple, after his death, builded it. But whereof, soever, this gate, Aldergate, took the name, which longeth chiefly to historians to know, at my friend's house, which, as I say, sta standeth so near that it is over it, I lay often times, and that for sundry causes, sometime for lack of other lodging, and sometime, as while my Greek alphabets were in printing, to see that it might be truly corrected. And sure it is a shame for all young men that they be no more studious in their tongues. Ah, oh, but a, what the world is now come to that pass, that if he can prate a little Latin and handle a racket and a pair of six square bowls, he shall sooner obtain any living than the best learned in the whole city, which is the cause that learning is so despised and bagatical things so much advanced. Hmm. <clears throat> While I lay at the foresaid house, for the causes aforesaid, I was lodged in a chamber hard by the printing house, which had a fair bay window opening in the garden, the earth whereof is almost as high as St Anne's church top, which standeth there by. At the end, other end of the printing house, as you enter in, is a side door and three or four steps which go up to the leads of the gate, whereas sometime quarters of men, which is a loathly and abominable sight, do stand upon poles. I, I call them abominable because it is not only against nature but against scripture, for God commanded by Moses that after the sun went down, all such as were hanged or otherwise put to death should be buried lest if the sun saw them the next day, that his wrath should come upon them and plague them, as he have done this many other realms for the like transgression. Oh, and I marvel where men have learned it, or for what they cause to do it, except it be to feed and please the devils. Oh, for sure, I believe ye some spirits, misanthropy or molochitis, who, who lived by the saviour of man's blood, did after their sacrifices failed, in which men were slain and offered unto them, put into butcherly heathen tyrants' heads to mangle and boil Christian transgressors, and set up their quarters for to feed upon them. And therefore I would counsel all men to bury or burn all executed bodies and refrain from making such abominable sacrifice as I have often seen with ravens or rather devils feeding upon them in this foresaid leads. <clears throat> yeah. In the which every night many cats assembled and there made such a noise that I could not sleep for them. Wherefore, on a time, 
I was sitting by the fire with certain of the house. I told them what a noise and what a wailing the cats had made there the night before, from ten o'clock to one, so that neither I could sleep nor study them, and by means of this introduction we fell in communication of cats. And some affirming, as I do now, but I was against it then, that they had understanding for confirmation whereof one of the servants told this story. There was in my country, quoth he, a man, uh, the fellow was born in Staffordshire, that had a young cat, which he had brought up a kitling, and would nightly dally and play with it. And on a time he rode through Cankwood about certain business. A cat, as he thought, leaped out of a bush before him, and called him twice or thrice by his name. But because he made none answer, nor spake, for he was so afraid that he could not, she spake to him plainly, twice or thrice, these words following. Commend me unto Titten Tatten, and to Puss thy Catten, and tell her that Grimalkin is dead. This done, she went her way, and the man went forward about his business. And after that he was returned home in an evening, sitting by the fire with his wife and his household. He told of his adventure in the wood, and when he had told them all the cat's message, his cat, which had hearkened unto the tale, looked upon him sadly, and at last said, And is Grimalkin dead? Then farewell, dame, and therewith went her way, and was never seen after. When this tale was done, another of the company, which had been in Ireland, asked this fellow when this thing which he had told happened. He answered that he could not tell well, howbeit, as he conjectured, not past eleven years, for his mother knew both the man and the woman which ought the cat that the message was sent unto. Sure, quoth the other, then it may well be, for about the same time as I heard a like thing happened in Ireland, where, if I conjecture not amiss, Grimalkin, of whom you spake, was slain. Yea, sir, quoth I, oh, I pray you how so? I will tell you, Master Streamer quoth he, that which was told me in Ireland, and which I have till now so little credited, that I was ashamed to report it, but hearing that I hear now, and calling to mind mine own experience when it was, I do so little misdoubt it, that I think I never told, nor you ever heard, a more likely tale. And the tale of the servant will be tomorrow's story as we continue in Beware the Cat and the first part of the oration. Uh, so, the story within a story within a story will begin next time as we go to Ireland and a story of monstrous eating, shall we say. Thank you very much for joining me this afternoon, this lunchtime, for this first part of Beware the Cat. I hope that my introduction was helpful, um, and for that matter, accurate. If it wasn't, uh, and you know of such things, do get in touch on Twitter at Beyond Shakes, and I will endeavour to fill in some additional gaps. If you have any questions or thoughts, do also share them online on Twitter at Beyond Shakes. Shakes. And uh, this week, not only am I doing readings here, live streaming on YouTube, but in the evenings we are doing a, a setting up a play reading group where we read and discuss plays. 
and those will be recorded and shared after those sessions are done. They're not going to be live streamed because, frankly, I have no idea how to do it. Um, but they are going to be recorded. So this week we're mostly doing interludes from before and after the period that uh, this 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 particular text is is set in. So uh, have a look at those. Otherwise, there's uh, a lot of uh, material that orbits the universe of Beware the Cat on the Beyond Shakespeare podcast. You can find that on any feed that you so like. Uh, so John Hayward, uh, though the work we have of his is earlier than this text, it does feed into that sort of courtly world of debate and thought and maybe of interest. So join me tomorrow for some more Beware the Cat as the cats get, shall we say, more sinister and more hungry. I've been Robert Crichton. You've been, hopefully, a wonderful audience, and I'll, I'll be here tomorrow. <laughs>